Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual program, Two Sides of the Red Line, hosted by the Maryland Historical Society. My name is Martha Osterbeel. I am the museum's community engagement manager, and we are really thrilled to have you all here with us today. We have a robust program with some really fabulous panelists and experts um, who we are thrilled um, to have with us as well. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, David Armenti. He is the Director of Education for the Maryland Historical Society and will be moderating and leading um, and guiding today's discussion. So without further ado, David, take it away. Thank you, Martha. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is David Armenti, Director of Education at the Maryland Historical Society. I'm extremely excited to welcome you all here today to learn about a fascinating topic, the history of redlining and housing discrimination, um, as well as their legacy and impact in the Baltimore area. As Martha mentioned, we're extremely lucky to be joined by our four special guests here today who are going to provide valuable perspectives on these issues. So I would like to welcome Stephanie Smith, who is the 45th District Representative um, in the Maryland House of Delegates, as well as Eric Holcomb, the Executive Director of the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, otherwise known as CHAP. Dr. Corey Henderson, who is a qualitative researcher focused on social justice and community development, as well as a historical trauma and policy expert. And Antero Piatilla, a former Baltimore Sun reporter and author of Not In My Neighborhood, How Bigotry Shaped a Great American City. So since we are scheduled for an hour and I don't wanna take up too much airspace when we have so much fabulous material to go through um, and perspectives from our guests here today, I wanna go ahead and get started with our conversation. So the first thing that we would like to do um, within this program is set the stage with what we currently see in Baltimore and the surrounding area today. I think many of us understand that the city and its area is still in many ways segregated and unequal, but what some folks might not know, and the, the purpose of the program here today is to show how that is a product, a product of its history um, here in Baltimore. The first thing that we would like to discuss just a bit to get us started um, is to look at the contemporary city from a mapping perspective and start to talk about how that relates to the historical context that we'll go into for some more detail. So for that first piece, um, I'd like to start with you, Eric. Um, could you talk to us a bit about what we're seeing here um, in terms of areas of the city and, and how it's reflective of some of these dynamics we'll go into from a historical perspective? Well, well, thank you very much. And I am just thrilled to be here with such uh, great people. Kudos to Martha and David for being the, the cat herders to make sure the panelists uh, stay on target. Um, so I just want to thank them very much. And also the other panelists, it's just a, a thrill to be with them, such uh, dignified uh, folk and uh, uh, really uh, interesting people. So I want to talk a little bit right now about what we're seeing here. This is the uh, 2017 housing market typology map. This is a map that's created every three years by the Department of Planning. And what it shows, it really shows the real estate market. Where is the healthy real estate markets and where are the unhealthy real estate markets? And if you look at purple, blue, and green, those are very healthy real estate markets. When you get into the red, uh, dark orange, and light orange, that's getting into more distressed neighborhoods. The reason I wanted to show this here is because if you see this, and if you look back onto, let's say, the 1937 residential security map, or the redlining map, as it's called, and here it is, you will see a correlation that both old and, uh, East Baltimore and Old West Baltimore 
are red. They are still distressed neighborhoods. They were distressed in 1937 and they're distressed now. And I would also suggest to you, if you look back on the 1893 uh, 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 Carroll, who was the Secretary of Labor, uh, who did a statistical analysis of five cities throughout the country uh, and identified different uh, slums, as he called it, he would have identified portions of these areas as slums and there's still uh, distressed neighborhoods now. And there's many reasons for that. I don't want to get into that now. We will get into it through the course of this uh, discussion. But I also want to talk about a couple of other things that has occurred. Uh, so we talked about the old East and West Baltimore uh, neighborhoods and how they are uh, distressed back at, in 1937 and still distressed. There was also another sort of uh, uh, pattern that has occurred, and that is what I call the Harbor Rim neighborhoods. Those are the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the Inner Harbor or, or, or the water area, your Canton, your Federal uh, Fells Point, your Federal Hill. All of those areas, as you see in the residential security map, were uh, pretty much red. Um, the reason why Fells Point isn't red right there is because it was also considered industrial. But those neighborhoods have drastically turned around and they turn around with uh, very specific uh, reasons, a lot of redevelopment effort, a lot of historic preservation activities. And really, as uh, 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 Bill Struver has said, it's sort of the, ro ro the romance of the water really attract redevelopment there. So the third thing I'd like to talk about is really sort of the outward uh, movement of declining neighborhoods. Almost every generation, you will see the neighborhoods for, uh, from the inner core and just going out uh, several blocks, almost every generation, you will start to see decline happening. You got the red areas in the 1937 map and then you get to the uh, yellow areas. Well, if you go back 10 years after uh, 1937, those yellow areas may be considered uh, red or d distressed neighborhoods. So you see this, this effort of uh, moving outward and that's also shown that what was occurring is the suburban areas out there were being developed. So you see sort of this leapfrog effect of generation growing up in one neighborhood, so the kids grow up and then they buy houses in the outer perimeter area. And that's the last point I want to really make too, is uh, what's been occurring out there in uh, most uh, suburban metropolitan areas around the country is, is a very uh, uh, distressing uh, uh, pattern that's occurring. Uh, for example, most of the inner city, well, most of the inner suburb, um, inner beltway neighborhoods have uh, around in the Baltimore County area are actually increasing in poverty rates far greater than uh, the uh, inner city neighborhoods. And we see this throughout the country. There are several great books out there that really talk about what's happening in the suburbs that were built in the 50s and early 60s. Those are starting to become distressed too. So with that in mind, I just wanted to talk about we are talking about some of the same neighborhoods that we've been talking about for a long time. We have seen redevelopment in, uh, in some great areas, and we still see that pattern of uh, distressing na uh, distressed neighborhoods marching out almost in a generation by generation. So with that in mind, I'll uh, stop talking. Certainly. And, you know, again, if any of our other panelists just want to jump in at times to, to piggyback on each other, feel free to do so and, and cut me off as necessary. Um, but I think what, what's really important about what we're trying to get at here is that connection of contemporary and current to the historical context. These are not new discussions that we're having, but the ability to make those connections and and show based on these resources um, how folks can learn more about it um, is going to be really important for a lot of different audiences. So I really want to jump back even, even further into our historical context um, to reveal some things that, that might not be um, readily known by a large amount of people. I think there's an assumption that segregation is something that has always been there, especially along racial lines. This is just the way it's been. It's, it's a product of the American experience, but that's not necessarily the case, um, you know, especially if you're looking at a city like Baltimore with its own unique history. Um, so I was hoping that, um, and Taro, if you wouldn't 
mind talking to us a little bit about the 19th century and, and possibly even earlier, what, what was the level of racial segregation or, or integration in Baltimore? And, you know, how did that kind of lead us into the 20th century dynamics we'll talk about a little more? Hello, everybody. I want uh, us to remember throughout this program that the legacies that we see in uh, Baltimore uh, neighborhoods are a direct uh, result of bigoted practices of the municipal and federal governments, as well as the discrimination of the real estate and lead lending industries. In the early days, everybody wa walked. Row house streets in Fells Point were racially mixed. But as Baltimore became an industrial revolution boom town in the decades before the Civil War, that changed. Waves of immigrants, particularly from German lands and Ireland, produced neighborhoods that were often anchored by Roman Catholic parishes. Such neighborhoods were culturally and politically cohesive and thrived on the exclusion of outsiders who did not belong. Other immigrant groups survived, the newcomers usually ending up in East Baltimore. Tens of thousands of Jewish refugees from Russian pogroms streamed here in the 1880s. They concentrated in the Old Town section even as earlier German Jews began migrating from there to uptown streets near Groot Hill Park. This led to ethnic neighborhood rotations that still continue. Baltimore, like the rest of America, is a story of cities that steadily experience racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic change. In slavery times, Baltimore had a large free black population, but later, even as the city kept attracting more African Americans, first from Maryland's countryside and then from Virginia and the Carolinas, no housing was constructed for blacks. This reality continued until the 1950s. Black areas could only expand by spilling over to white blocks. This led to conflicts. Overall, race relations deteriorated after the collapse of Reconstruction and the 1899 victory of the Democratic Party in Baltimore, whose slogan declared, this is a white man's city. When an African-American lawyer in 1910 bought a, on a white block, the Sun declared that Baltimore was under a Negro invasion. The city council enacted a residential segregation law, the first one in the nation. People could only move to blocks where their race was in the majority. During the same period, much of everyday life became segregated. There were separate school systems for the races, separate parks. Blacks were barred from patronizing downtown department stores, leading hotels, restaurants, and theaters served only whites. Even music was segregated. Because Baltimore Symphony Orchestra concerts were not open to blacks, a separate colored symphony played in the 1930s. It was financed by a white donor, a music lover who did not want to be identified or to attend any concerts. Such was Baltimore, a city that became a laboratory of segregation. Thank you. And, and there are just so many different dynamics that are, that are intertwining there. You know, whether it be urban redevelopment, immigration, um, the different waves of migration that are occurring throughout the city. Um, and I think especially looking at that turn of the century period, um, I'll look to, to Corey and, and even to, to Stephanie to talk about what, what did those movements, what did those kind of municipal decisions mean and how did they impact public health, um, the infrastructure that was available to the various communities that existed in Baltimore? I'll start with passing it to Stephanie. Um, give Stephanie an opportunity to speak on that and then I'll respond. Thank you, David, and thank you, Corey. So um, as, you, as both Antero and Eric mentioned, there was a lot of intentionality around the transformation from, at some point, a more integrated, um, not just racially, but even um, um, economically living arrangement to what became intentionally segregated um, realities. And that meant access to sanitation, access to all these things that make it capable for folks to live 
um, a productive and safe life were compromised because of decisions that were being made at not only the municipal level, but also at the federal level. So um, some of the things we have to keep in mind is when you look at that 1937 residential security map that I believe Eric showed at the very beginning, almost any other um, map that you see, whether it's a map of um, um, the externalities of um, um, basically systemic racism and how that leads to health disparities. I try not to use health disparities because it's not an accident, right? It's not just all of a sudden people have health disparities. It's because they are only allowed to live in certain parts of our city and they're not able to acquire and accrue the wealth building opportunities of home ownership that other um, residents have been able to have. So as we understand at every moment, when you're denied the ability to accumulate wealth, that will impact your health. One of the things that I think we um, don't have as direct a conversation about, and particularly for me because I sit on the education subcommittee for the House Ways and Means, is that the number one predictor of academic achievement is household income. So it's not only how much money do people um, take in through their, their, their wages, it's also about all of the generations of wealth that they've been denied um, through some of the policies that were enacted at the turn of the last century. So um, I think that, you know, there have been a, there has been a history of not only planning at the local level, um, creating a situation where highways were dividing once vibrant communities, cutting them off from not just communication, but from even commerce at a community level. These are all decisions that have often been made that do not um, lead to, um, particularly our Black residents having the same opportunities to accrue wealth, to pass that wealth forward, and to live a life where they're able to um, have the opportunity to shop at a grocery store that has everything that they need. I mean, right now, we're having a current conversation in the city because just that 1937 map and the 2017 housing, housing um, typology map show the same places that you see where there's weak housing markets are the same places where we're not seeing um, grocery stores located. They're the same places where people do not see certain recreational amenities from the private sector come in and that there's also sometimes a quality differential in what's being offered for those amenities even and are um, publicly funded um, recreational amenities. So all of these things make up your quality of life, the condition of your home, the amenities that are available to you for food, for healthcare, and then also um, layered into all of these decisions, and one that we um, probably will get to later, are decisions about what type of transportation opportunities are available to you. Baltimore City has a transportation reality where um, when you look at the communities that have some of the highest um, um, transportation um, times to the, um, to the work and job centers of our region, they have also the highest rates of unemployment. So when you think about the state lack of investment in transportation in the Baltimore region, it is really picking winners and losers. And it's also making it difficult to be a reliable worker if you're depending on an unreliable um, structure to get you to all the places you need to go. So those are just a couple of the things that came to mind for me. It wasn't by chance that you actually started the conversation. I pass it to you because I think that building on with Stephanie just said, um, the biggest issue that we find in, in thinking about trauma, before I begin that, let me just first of all just give a moment to the life of John Lewis. Um, today, he's being buried. And, and I think that we have to, in this conversation, connect ourselves to the humanity that someone who allowed for love to guide their decision making. Um, we're having a conversation about how do we come together around things that divide us. And I think it's important to take note of uh, the, the funeral of a gentleman who not only gave his life for a country who could care less about him voting, let alone standing. Um, we, we should recognize that we should also allow ourselves to be in an uncomfortable place, that this discourse is not easy, but it's necessary to heal. And, and, and I'll start with healing that the first three steps of healing that the body uh, naturally goes into is the body recognizes that it's wounded. That's the first thing that we must do is recognize some wounds. The second thing we must do is stop the bleeding. And we have to recognize that there is bleeding taking place because we continue to be wounded and we continue this place of uh, continual reparation or, or repair. And then the third thing is to prepare ourselves to be in an open space of, of not only healing and recognition, but also, how do we get back to a place of homeostasis? 
And I think that if we're going to talk about American history, as Stephanie and Eric and, and Terrell alluded to, our history runs so deep that the Black society was told, you have no place here. And if we go back to the 1600s with the Casual Killing Act, that a, a white woman killing a slave child, trying to indoctrinate them into being a slave, it, hey, no worry, you killed them by mistake. It's not a crime here. We're seeing that same policy in the way policing is done. Hey, if you kill someone, you didn't mean to do it, they were bad anyway. That type of psyche, this story, this narrative that's been told from the Capitol Killing Act to the Zong Massacre, you look up the Zong Massacre, you'll understand that 131 slaves were thrown overboard, many of them alive on a slave ship. And when they went to go file claims for these alive individuals, the courts in England and around the world said, hey, they, they were property. It's like throwing wood overboard. So you begin with the 400 years of a psyche that you don't matter. And wherever we place you, you better be okay with this is all you have. And we bring it forward with communities that lack opportunity, economics, opportunity to, to go to a place where they matter. And we talk about Black Lives Matter. And then we have the counter, All Lives Matter. I'll close on this before I pass it back to David. If your mate says to you, I love you, and in, in response you say, baby, I love everybody, she's going to say, excuse me, not, hey, I love you too. And that's all we're saying. We want to be loved and matter, and the only way we get to that place is to recognize that we're wounded so we can stop the bleeding. Thank you both. And, you know, some of the, the important points that we, we want to build on there as Yes, not just municipal policy, as Stephanie said, but we're looking at federal, we're looking at the various levels, and then also the personal, which I think is what Corey is starting to get at, and, and we'll certainly see that these laws are created by people. Policies are created by people, and they had very personal motivations, um, as Intero alluded to as well. So I think that's a good way to segue into what is it about Baltimore that was so unique during this time. We, we have the foundation of understanding um, immigration. Certainly the, the end of enslavement in the 1860s um, caused a, a shift in the demographics in Maryland and, and coming into Baltimore as well. Um, but it's, I think that that turning point um, often comes with the looking at the specific law that was passed here in Baltimore. So. Um, and Tara, would you mind going into a little bit more detail about the, the law that was passed by the city council? How did that come about and, and how did it actually get implemented um, here in Baltimore as a, a pioneering um, instance of, of racial segregation? It, it, it came about when uh, a black attorney, W. Ashby Hawkins, bought a house at 1834 McCullough Street on a white block. And, and what had happened in, in that area was that that area had been undergoing a white ethnic change from Christian whites to Jewish whites. And during that time, when Christian whites fled, the vacancies developed and there were no takers. And so Ashby Hawkins then decided, well, let me buy that house. And he did. And that then prompted this, this uh, uh, reaction and backlash. And, and uh, the, the uh, city council uh, ended up passing several versions of this law because every, everything was defective in some fashion. And, and uh, so, so Baltimore became an officially segregated uh, city. At the same time, the enforcement was very haphazard. And so it did not uh, change, uh, it, it did not halt uh, the racial transition. Uh, and, and so, so that's, that's how it began. And yeah, certainly, if, if, yeah, go ahead. I, if, 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 uh, if I had add on, add on to that too, is, is this, this was really important almost worldwide. You could go to the Baltimore uh, uh, city archives and you could read letters from South Africa, letters from uh, uh, New Orleans, and folks are asking, hey, I hear about this new uh, segregation ordinance. Can you tell us more about it? So this was something that was uh, actually occurring in, you know, in, in, in a global way, which was uh, the segregation by neighborhood. And that was also something that was uh, 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 allowed by sort of the technological innovations that were occurring 
You had the horse car that came into Baltimore in 1859. You had the electric street car that shows up in about 1893. And then uh, and by the 1920s, you have sort of the highways and the automobile. And all of that allowed for the segregation uh, of races that, 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 that occurred. So when we talk about the 1910, and, and Antonio says that that really didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was, they, it was actually found to be uh, unlawful several times. But we were still in this race of segregation, and it was done almost through the suburbanization. And we could talk about uh, the ordinances that, that, that we talked about the ordinances, but zoning plays a part in it. Zoning comes into Baltimore in 1923 with its comprehensive zoning ordinance. It gets uh, uh, supported by the courts by 1931. So we have the zoning, we have um, sort of the deed covenants that come into play too. That's sort of a private agreement. It basically says that, you know, in your deed covenant in many of the neighborhoods on the outer areas of Baltimore City and even in the, in the county, you will see that it says that no African American uh, can buy here and can't even stay unless they're a, uh, a civil, a, a servant of some sort. So I think what we have really going on here is underlying everything is this racial attitude. And we see this racial attitude sort of really come into being with sort of the, 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 the flourishing of that lost cause mythology, which really creates sort of the uh, Confederate monuments that are being created in Baltimore. 1903, we get the soldiers and sailors. In 1916, we get the Confederate Women's Monument. And then in 1948, we get the Lee Jackson. But the 1948 monument, even though it was dedicated in 48, it was actually money was given to it in the, the mid-1920s. So we see this overwhelming uh, racial ways of, that we are, are, are looking at things. It's, it's always underneath every piece of history that we could look at in, in, in Baltimore. If I can respond and just add to what uh, is being said here, I think uh, if we're going to talk about some of the historical context, even though we're talking about housing, uh, we have to consider that housing is one aspect of living. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about economic, we're talking about jobs, we're talking about public health infrastructure. Um, so all of those uh, parts of the history are impacting and affecting all of this. Uh, in the late 1800s, early 1890s, when Blacks first came to Baltimore, Frederick, Maryland, uh, for the huge impact of physicians who wanted to come and learn public health. They wrote a letter to Johns Hopkins University and said, hey, we've tried to apply, got no response. And in response, they received a letter in the early 1900s from one of the deans who said, we don't recognize black doctors. They don't want to practice with you. There's no such thing um, as a black doctor. And, and the idea that the infrastructure of the community around its own health infrastructure then you add to that the economic infrastructure of, well, you can't become a CPA. You, you cannot practice as a certified public accountant coming out of the, agra uh, the agrarian society to a society where manufacturing and, and large corporations were built. If we can't certify the dollars and the credit that you say you have, then you can't take a small business and become a larger business or a corporation. It wasn't until 1957, I believe, we had our first black CPA in Baltimore, uh, Mr. King. Um, he's right over in, off of Park Heights. Uh, so, so some of the infrastructure parts of the community go back to not just housing, but communities where the black dollar wanted to circulate within its own black dollar uh, community and, and passing that dollar back and forth. The measure of its wealth is how many times does the, does the dollar pass within your community? And, and that community protection was lost. So even within our own community, when you had in 1920, uh, 1919, over 26 cities burned down of black wealth, when you had in 1919, uh, we just celebrated, uh, what, 100 years ago, 26 cities of black wealth torn down or burned down because people didn't want blacks to have anything, let alone even contained within their community. The highways were built specifically. Look at 95, look at the highways going west. They cut through communities of black power and black wealth. There, there were once a, a place where you could go. You had a family member pass away. You would go to a funeral home by a black, owned by a black. You go to a store owned by a black man or woman. You go to a cleaner's owned by a black man or woman. 
but you couldn't have a black pharmacist because they, you weren't accepted or respected to even get that at level of education. And that begins to wear on your psyche that the higher levels of position and opportunity in the community are only limited to people of other colors and races. And just very quickly on Hanover Street, uh, for instance, one side of Hanover Street was white, one side was black. And when I interviewed individuals and they talked about living on that, that block, you had one side where you had a movie theater that was white only, one side where it was a movie theater that was black only. You went to church and you met people there. On one side, there was a black church. On the other side, there was a white church. But when you went to go to the pharmacy, there was a white pharmacist. And on the other side of the street, there was a white pharmacist. So you begin to see how you, you, in your psyche, you learn that you really can't get out of this. You, you have to stay in your place. And that begins to wear on a person, and which leads to alcoholism, drinking, drug addictions, and everything else when a community is inundated with, you can't break out. I, I, was, I just like to just reinforce what was happening in the earliest 20th century with sort of the segregation. Remember, in the 1890s was the first time an African American was elected to the Baltimore City Council, and that was because we we actually got a African American neighborhood that had an African American majority that could vote had voting power, and that was actually stripped away, consciously stripped away by sort of redistricting the councilmanic boundaries at that time. Yeah, and if I can just say it articulate specifically, I don't want to miss any of the the facts. The cities that really went through this form of uh, racial terror, and we call it racial terror because they were terrorized. Uh, Wilmington in 1898, Springfield in 1908, Red Summer of 1919, over 26 cities, Tulsa in 1921, Rosewood in 1923. Um, the EJI, the Equal Justice Institute, has been doing research and has discovered that not only have there been over 4,000 lynchings since the late 1860s, but there are, in addition, another 2,000 that were not even documented, that they're trying to get more facts. So we, we're dealing with not only a level of trauma, but when we talk about people moving and uprooting from the South to move North, there's this idea that, hey, if I get up and move, then me being able to move and go to a place where I can just kind of settle and restart, I'm leaving my trauma behind. And, and I say in my paper that trauma travels with you. If you've been abused in your previous relationship and you try to start a new relationship without dealing with the pain of the abuse of the last relationship, every disagreement, argument, or anything you experience in the new relationship will be a reminder of what you experienced before. So trauma is just, it's, it's a continual beating, beating, beating of segregation, serial force displacement, physical and psychological abuse, economic destruction, and cultural loss. And I know one of the questions coming up is what we, what, where are we in this? And I think that we need to recognize as a community, even individually, as a family, and for personal, interpersonal relationships, the uh, policy level, the, the uh, community level, the governmental level, we have literally found ourselves in a place where collectively we deal with being segregated. And as I described, all of that pain builds up that when you say there's quasi-integration opportunities, the first thing people do is jump at the opportunity to get out of the community that they can't stand. And it's not that they can't stand the people they live next to because they became a community. It's the idea that this is my chance to give my children and my family a better opportunity than what I had. And if you see to the right of this uh, on the screen, the trauma response is really what's killing us. And we talk about the violence, but no one wants to talk about the root of it. The social response, resulting in breakdown of community and family structures. The family has been battered and bruised by just the, the stripping of the black men of the community. And I'll go back to lynching very quickly, speaking about the family structure. Imagine coming home and finding out that you need to pack up in two minutes and get out of the house because they're coming to lynch your father because he's doing too well. And now you run out of, out of town and you, you find that your father's been lynched. Women weren't able to work back then, at least to have a job that anyone would respect because they did day's work or they weren't allowed to get an education, weren't allowed to vote yet. Uh, all of the things happening, now you feel like you're really upside down and your family has to start over. You left everything behind. And at the end of the day, you find yourself in a place where you change your last name by adding an S on the end of it. You do something to change your identity. 
you're not even living in the place of who you are anymore. So you lose yourself. And, and that's, th this is what we're describing when we talk about trauma, that this thing here is so important that we begin to allow people to have a place to stop the bleeding, to speak openly about it and be uncomfortable in a place to communicate, that if we can't learn how to disagree in our homes, how can we disagree and learn how to have honest discourse in an open and public setting when just inside the house, we are afraid to talk about these types of levels of pain and what it means to feel discriminated against, harassed, or even the microaggressions of pain. And I'll leave it there. David, can you offer something? I'm sure. sorry, okay. Um, I was just listening to everything that Corey was sharing and I mean, it's spot on. There was just one thing I wanted to lift up that I think is really important in the context of Baltimore when you're considering trauma and um, just your, your body being traumatized and your mental um, is the, the fact that people are being impacted by also environmental factors. I mean, the legacy of lead paint and what was allowed to occur in certain communities and what that means for um, people's entire generations moving forward. It, it isn't just one individual that's impacted when someone is poisoned, you know, by lead paint. It impacts generations. And I remember I used to work very closely with um, a neurologist um, who worked with physicians for social responsibility. And one of the ways he described these um, types of um, threats to your ability for your brain to properly develop, he called it intellectual theft. Someone who may have been average is now denied even that. Someone who may have been exceptional may now be average. And he was talking about all types of pollution where it could be mercury, you know, all types of toxic threats. But it said something to me, we've robbed people of potential. We've robbed them of the soundness and peace they could have in their own minds by allowing um, lead paint and the legacy of that to still permeate, um, you know, our, our current reality. This affects our criminal justice. This affects so many different things that um, I think that sometimes it gets a little bit where people are tired of hearing about it, but people are still being impacted by it. It didn't end. So I wanted to lift that up as on another source of the trauma are the policy violence that is perpetrated upon folks who have no choice but to be exposed to either threats from air pollution because of where they're living. They're living near an incinerator. They're living near some other type of um, industrial, um, you know, um, facility or some other polluting facility. And I think that's something that we consider many of our industrial cities um, are now brownfields and now have some of these other legacies that make um, either redevelopment of communities that have already faced all the other challenges we've mentioned, it makes it that much more harder, much more difficult, and also more expensive sometimes. The remediation effects um, that are needed, remediation efforts rather that are needed to make some of these um, neighborhoods suitable. I think that's just another part of the conversation I want to factor in where environmental threats um, explicitly. David, if I could just chime in very quickly, I, I promise I'll be very brief. Um, I think that what Stephanie brought up is very important because we have to realize that with the public health epidemic, and we could talk about the Spanish flu of 1918 or any of the other pandemics, I'm, I'm a public health uh, practitioner, but we live, we're living through this now. So, so this is real to us. And the idea that redlining drew a line around communities and said, stay there and, and your pain must stay there too. And, and within our own communities, we've lost the ability, as I said before, how do we heal? Well, first we gotta recognize we're wounded. We gotta recognize what caused the wound so that we don't keep running into that wall or keep stabbing ourselves with that pencil or, or doing the thing that's causing the wounding, which is walking around like we're okay when we're not. And it's okay to say, I'm not okay. And, and I think that that's where we start within our home, within our community to have a place to say, I'm not okay. I'm tired, I'm crying, I, I'm hurting. I'm watching my daughter do an experience. I'm watching my son experience. Find something to connect yourself to, to begin the healing. But if there are two things that I want people to take away from this, is that the red line did not stop anything from spreading. With, with people saying, oh, coronavirus is a black disease, and you know they, I'm so glad they closed the basketball courts. I've heard ignorant things like that. But unfortunately, just like with heroin and the drug epidemic, now we have opioids that we're trying to solve for. These things don't stay in one community. The trauma will find its way to where you live. So if you really want to move forward as a community, as a people, we need to uplift each other and walk together.
because I think it was maybe uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King who once said, Malcolm X specifically, who said, if you try to hold me down, you got to stay down with me. And the idea that we try to put borders around things and they will not spread, people move, people mate, and, and things happen and stories are told. So we're going to clean up our streets. We're going to clean up our internal psyche and our psychological, our mental, our physical. Then we have to not only recognize we're wounded, but we also have to recognize who's interfacing with us. And if they don't see my pain and understand where it comes from, the, the police department, hey, it, the, the, the training that you're getting, you're not from Baltimore. How is it that you don't know? That's the only job in the world that you can do that no one ever asks you on your interview, what do you know about this company? What do you know about where you're about to work? Hey, we need bodies. Every other job that you have, you have to know something about the corporation. You can't get a job at Target if you ain't looked up on a website what it is about Target that makes you want to work there. So the idea that we're not teaching this level of compassion, community compassion, as I describe it in a police training program I've been working on, community compassion and community conversation. How is it that you can't connect with me? So when I get out the car, you call me out my name and you expect me like a dog or an animal to get down on the ground, but you want to disrespect me. At some point, I've lost my hope. So now I'm going to fight you back. There, there's no level of respect here. So these are the things that we have to actually face and teach this history the real way, meaning that go to the facts and let people discuss how we can move forward. I, I appreciate all of that conversation. I think it's so important that we're working here in this discussion to connect trauma and, and the emotional impact that this has, not just the physical environment and places that people live, but how, how does that weigh on them um, over generations as, as both of you were discussing so well there. I do wanna try to circle it back around to um, some of the policy that kind of frames um, these dynamics as they're developing here in Baltimore. A few points I just wanna acknowledge um, first of all, Stephanie, I love that term, policy violence. I've never heard that before because I think it pairs really nicely with the idea that, oh, well, if it's not violence, if it's not um, that kind of overt action, such as the race-based terror that we see through lynching, well, you know, then it, it wasn't quite as bad as maybe you might have seen in a Wilmington or, or some of those other examples that were historically mentioned, but um, as well as the policy that goes into that is so important. Um, Somebody did ask within the chat, what is the name of the 1910 law? Um, and I've seen it alternately referred to as the West Law, um, as well as Ordinance 610, um, and even the Baltimore Plan, as it was modeled by other cities. And, and Eric even mentioned places that wrote in from internationally about how do you get the segregation in place policy-wise? Um, so I did want to acknowledge that question and of course point them to not in my neighborhood for, for all of the elaboration on that particular topic. So if we can kind of circle it back to the national level, um, the, the actual term redlining came out of this de development with the National Housing Act of 19. What, what was actually the purpose of this exercise in redlining and how did it practically impact communities around the country as well as Baltimore? 239 cities were redlined by the federal uh, government. And the reason for redlining was that the country was in the midst of the Great Depression. And so they wanted to divide those cities into areas that would be good for lending and areas that where lending should be avoided. And what is interesting is that in, in recommending areas for lending, one of the requirements that the federal government was that all of those uh, uh, top grade neighborhoods should have restrictive covenants, meaning that they would restrict the, uh, um, the occupancy in, in those areas of blacks and Jews and, and some other nationalities. So it was an exclusionary uh, measure. Now, now the, the plus side, if, if, uh, if you look at the plus side of the exercise was that it paved the way to uh, what we have today, which are 30-year mortgages. Uh, and, and so, so uh, in, in those days, even the best customers could only get mortgages for seven years, and then you had to refinance it, and it was very difficult. So this was, this was the good thing that came out of it. 
but what, what it also did, it, it divided the, the country into, into uh, cities where, where, um, where, where spending and, and, uh, and uh, which, which introduced unequal spending in neighborhoods as well as in city services. So, so um, that's uh, that's uh, and 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 you have to remember that that uh, the redlining practices they persisted certainly until 1968 and beyond. So, so this was this was a turning point in our lives. If I could just sort of reinforce a couple things about redlining. Of course, when 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 you go out there to try to identify what a slum neighborhood is or what a blighted neighborhood is, you need to define what slum and blight is. And one of the ways they did it was to to identify the folks that lived there. So you could see in the 1937 uh, um, criteria of how to define what a what a red neighborhood is, what a green neighborhood is, you will see that it also looks at to see, are they uh, foreigners, are they blacks, what are African-Americans, you know, who's living there, and that's an indicator. But that doesn't stop there. That actually began in, in 1893 with uh, uh, the, uh, Secretary of uh, Labor Carroll's uh, work that he did. In uh, 1907, we had, uh, uh, other criteria of uh, other um, studies out there and, and all of these studies out there of trying to identify where the distressed or where the blighted slums are uh, use sort of that characteristics of who lives there as as a, a defining characteristic of what a slum is so it's really just built in it's a self uh, fulfilling prophecy in, in many ways of uh, and that's just it's something, and that just keeps on going all the way up until uh, 1963. You could see in some of the reports that are in the city archives, uh, uh, dozens of these sort of planning reports uses these ideas. There's also sort of an anti-urban idea that was going on at the same time too with the creation of, the, uh, of, of suburbia out there. And as that is sort of being the big real estate boom. And I'll just end it with the fact is that when uh, veterans came back from World War II, they were offered uh, housing loans. And, you know, millions of uh, veterans, uh, well, hundreds of thousands of veterans received that, but less than 400 African Americans received a, a veteran loan for a mortgage. So that just shows how, how disproportionate these, these policies were. And those are some of the things as, as a uh, city planner, as a historic preservationist, and as an urban historian um, are really important to sort of grasp. And then I look to folks like Dr. Henderson and Delegate Smith to say, okay, what do we do? How can, we ha how can I help move forward to a better, uh, a better Baltimore? Two more points. Uh, the the redlining exercise happened at a time when there are there were no conventional lending available to blacks. So so that was that was one thing. The other thing is that redlining did not think about uh, gentrification as a possibility, meaning that a declining neighborhood they thought was was uh, a uh, losing proposition, and so so that that again then uh, led to, to deprivation of public funds and private funds into areas that were seen as, as risky. And I was just going to add in, David, very quickly, for those I, I saw in the chat that there are students here and also people who want to be students of this history. If you uh, go to uh, my dissertation, which will, might be shared with you, a resource on the uh, website, um, the link, you can actually find on my website in that document about 85 different resources. Uh, if you want to do the work, I've already done it for you. Uh, much of the documents from the work in papers written by Powers, um, I, I've read books, I, I've done a lot of the work so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we should stand on each other's shoulders and build on what we know uh, rather than take another two years or seven years like I did for my doctorate. Um, don't, don't, don't waste seven years, just take the information, you can go look it up. I have all the resources there. It starts at page 134 and it goes to like page 147 or something like that. So it's, it's about 85 resources that you can find information to begin to challenge your thinking and learning. And even in, in the back of Intero's book, uh, which I've read, uh, you'll find a lot of resources that we have to reference 
as professionals and academics. Um, and, and for students, plagiarism is not, it's not allowed. So basically we want to share with you where you can find what we're saying and verify it. So take advantage of that. And I should, that's a good moment to reiterate that we, we are at less than 10 minutes to our formal end time and we will be following up with all registrants with additional resources, including Dr. Corey Henderson's resources from his website, um, as well as for the different audiences that are in the room, so to speak here, educators, um, students themselves, folks that actually have some history and academic background as well. So primary source collections, secondary material, as well as some of the, the academically oriented material that our, um, our experts here on the panel today have featured. So I do wanna to refer to um, one of the chat questions because I think it's kind of, um, it's getting zeroing in on some of the things we've been discussing in of the lifetime trickle down effect of redlining as it pertains to neighborhood infrastructure and school funding. So we talked about this with 100 years ago, how infrastructure breaking down impacted communities. How does that relate to housing, redlining, um, and this idea of funding coming into communities even still today? David, could I jump in? Please, yes. So I wanted to um, address not only that question, so great minds think alike, but also another, I thought, related question, because some folks are saying, aren't we talking about redlining? Yes, we are. So I think that um, thanks to both Antero and Eric, we talked about redlining was a solution to many previous attempts <laughs> to um, memorialize various forms of um, segregation. When the, when the um, ordinance in and, and Baltimore City you know, was um, no longer permissible under law, people just kept trying to find a new way to um, <laughs> create um, a segregated reality. So after redlining becomes something that is no longer legally tenable, and, and we have you know, advances like the Fair Housing Act and a lot of other laws that are seeking to address discrimination, that doesn't necessarily mean that those laws are gonna bring about all of the changes we want because there's other systems at play, right? Outside of government, there's also um, a capitalist structure where people can, through their own you know, their, their own agency, make decisions about where they want to invest and what they want to do. So I want to bring the listeners' attention to a couple of things. So um, when you consider um, that redlining was essentially picking winners and losers and really making it harder for um, communities that already withstood the realities of slavery um, and were in the throes of Jim Crow and are still, you know, dealing with those effects, you're saying that your access to capital will be forever at a lower level. And that access to capital is going to affect your ability to acquire property, start a business, and do a lot of the things that would make your community as vibrant as it could be. And if you have the opportunity to start a business, the ability to expand it, the ability to make it more robust are also hindered by that lack of capital. So one of the things that we have to realize right now is despite the fact that we have a woefully low amount of black owned businesses and a majority black city is that in just from February to I believe um, June, we've lost 41% of all black businesses across the country. So we already started with too few black owned businesses and now they're nearly, you know, um, halved and, and, and many are, are, are struggling to stay alive. Why is this relevant to the question you asked me, um, David? It's relevant because we've created a system that has invested in a way that is not equitable across our city and across our state and quite frankly across our nation. So um, I know there was an Urban Institute study that came out late last year that discussed what is really driving capital investments in Baltimore. And what I think was interesting is that despite a history of um, you know, redlining, despite a history of, of discriminatory ordinances, it showed that 90% of capital investments are um, really influenced by private sector decisions, but to the extent um, government is um, investing in capital improvements in the city, it actually has more equitable results, which I think would be surprising to people. Um, it's still not enough to, um, I think, um, address legacies of disinvestment and address the legacies of other harmful um, policy, um, I would say interventions or lack of intervention. But um, I think it's, it's something worth pointing out to folks is that to right the ship, government has a role, but it doesn't have the only role. And I think when we think of the government, we tend to think of legislative bodies and we tend to think sometimes of governors and presidents, but we have, um, um, we have a, um, 
uh, a part of the Richmond <laughs> Federal Reserve Bank right here in Baltimore City. And their um, charge as the Federal Reserve is on gainful employment. They also have a big role in, in encouraging our local lenders to actually be more targeted in where they're investing. And I think that um, to the extent our, um, our, our political and other um, economic brain trusts leans on the Fed to show more leadership in our region to get um, lenders to really um, diversify. I mean, they're, they're actually sitting, um, pre-COVID, they were sitting on record amounts of, um, of funds, yet it didn't it wasn't translating to investments in some of our historically disinvested communities. So we have a you know community reinvestment act at the federal level that requires banks to really um, make sure that they're making inv targeted investments in um, underserved communities. But how well are they complying with the CRA? That's I think another opportunity for us to look at all of this disinvestment, all of this uneven um, you know investment, and to the present, who are we holding accountable? I think that. Um, the lenders need to be a more prominent part of the conversation and we need to work with the mechanisms that have more um, power and have more leverage over them to have that conversation. But in terms of education funding specifically, many people know that the state has um, been um, discussing an overhaul of its public education and we know currently that 53% um, of all African American students in Maryland are attending an underfunded school as opposed to 8% of white students. And we do know that our school schools are largely um, funded at the municipal level based on um, you know, property taxes and in terms of what land is worth. Now, because Baltimore City is uniquely dependent on state funding for our public education, we, you always hear about, oh, we spend so much money from the state on public education. That is true, but we're not able to pair with that um, municipal funds that are as generous as some of our richer um, jurisdictions that surround us. So even though they may get less from the state, they're able to add so much more from their municipal funds. And um, you know, part of the reason why um, Baltimore is in this unique challenge, and it's something that hasn't come up in this conversation, is that we have so much land that we can't tax because we have very large landowners that are nonprofits. They are um, colleges, they are hospitals. So if 31% of our land is already, you know, <laughs> we can't really, we can't taxes off of that. That means that we're trying to get more from less um, taxpayers. And that is something that I think is um, not always appreciated. Like we have all the other challenges you mentioned, but if from the top, a third of our land is not taxable, that creates more strain on our budget to provide um, cover for a lot of our quality of life investments. Does it mean we can't do better? No, but I think we're gonna have to be a lot more creative on where we get revenues from. And, it, and it, we should not, um, it can't be in regressive ways that further penalize people that have already gotten too little out of this experience of being Baltimore natives or Baltimore residents and the very um, red line communities that we've been discussing. And what you're getting at there is a really nice summarizing piece as we're uh, coming up on, on one o'clock here is what are, you know, we've, we've been presented with a lot of historical context, a lot of challenges, um, even in the current environment. What are some of these solution-oriented calls to action um, that we can hopefully provide for some of our listeners here today? So in a sense, that would be putting pressure on those government entities that, as Stephanie was talking about, kind of hold the purse strings on, on investment um, and even creating those calculations. These are things that maybe your average citizen is not aware of and that your, your representatives ha do have some impact on, on the ability to move in that direction. Um, so I do wonder if in our last couple minutes here, if they're looking toward solutions um, within either housing or, or the benefits to communities um, or just any other summarizing point about um, what we're talking about here today. If I can piggyback on what Stephanie said as a closing remark, um, policy moves people. Whether we want to admit it or not, I think Antero was very clear when he said it was the policies, it's the ordinances, it's the it's the things that we sit back and so uh, are so distracted by all of the different things happening around us. It's no way we could all be involved in everything. But the one thing we need to really be focused in and, and, and zoomed in on is what policies are trying to move us, force us, or or uh, push us into positions where we may be doing something illegal because we didn't know the policy existed. 
Uh, so policy moves people, and we have to be connected to what's happening around us to actually maintain our voice. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think I can speak for most people in the chat um, and you know, would say that this has been a really informative and enlightening um, panel, and we really are grateful for the expertise that you all gave. Um, to echo David, we are going to send a follow-up email to everyone who registered. Um, I will come through the chat to look at all of the resources that you all shared, and we will put them in one place um, and send them out most likely early next week um, with the recording to this program so that you can watch again and, and share with your friends. Um, I just want to leave you with one thing. Um, our next virtual program uh, hosted by the Maryland Historical Society is on, on um, we will be talking about uh, Maryland's historic amusement parks with special consideration to Gwen Oak Park, um, which was one of the first amusement parks to desegregate in the early 60s. Um, I hope some of you will find it interesting and, you know, we'd love to see you um, show up at that virtual program as well. Um, so again, thank you for you all. Thank you for attending. Thank you to our panelists um, and we will hopefully see you soon. Take care everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone.